There we go. Sorry, guys. That's my fault. Well, good morning again. How are you? Glad you're here, and uh, we're excited. I, I got to tell you, I, I'm so excited this week. I found the key to success. So last week I was telling you we needed to pray for the Steelers a little bit more. You did it. We won. But the key to them continuing to win is I brought Pastor Manning to the game. He's never been to a Steelers game, so I, I think I got to bring him to every game from here on out, right? So <laughs> that's the key. That's the key. It was an awesome first game to go to, right? Overtime. Um, it, it was wild. It was fun. But 1.30, I need to talk to the coach about a little bit. You know, you know we're getting old. You can't stay up till 1.30 in the morning anymore. So, all right. Well, uh, next week, I'm so excited about our feast. It's our first, uh, not that we've never had a feast before, but this is the first time in the format that we've, we've done it this way. On your seats is a bring bite. So, uh, you know, take one for your fridge. If you need more, the usher's got plenty of these. You can take as many as you want, but bring some people with you. Load up your cars, bring them. This is just such an amazing opportunity for people that maybe aren't comfortable with church or, you know, what, whatever their view is of church or their perspective. This is a great time to bring them. Uh, it's going to start, remember, our service times changed just for next week only, just for the feast, 10 to 2. So if you come at 9, you're going to be early. We'll get you to work. If you come at 11, you could still be part of the festival, but it starts at what time? 10. 10. So don't show up at 9 or 11. Come at 10. 10 o'clock, we're, we're looking forward to it, and it goes till 2 o'clock, all right? So we're going to have a, you're gonna actually going to come in here at 10 o'clock in the sanctuary. We're going to start with some powerful worship. There's going to be an amazing testimony. If anybody wants to be water baptized, we still have room for you, so just let us know, sign up, and we're going to do water baptisms, and then we're just going to go and celebrate and have a great time together. Uh, if you want to volunteer, it doesn't matter what your age is. You could, be a, you could be a child. You can be an adult. We've got room for you to serve, and uh, maybe you're saying, well, I, I don't know what I do. Don't worry. We'll plug you in. There's, you can serve food. There's, there's an uh, uh, inflatable section where we're going to be helping kids get in and out of inflatables, and then we've got to wipe them down so often, of course, COVID-friendly. And then we also are going to have uh, a photo opportunity for families to get a family snapshot. So, uh, so particularly you younger kids, because you're better with selfies than mom and dad, right? We don't get any selfies as mom and dad. So we want the young people to get in there, get some pictures. But there's a place for everyone, you know, from making caramel apples to set up to tear down. And so we're just going to need as many hands on deck. And we really want to do this together. So I don't want it to be just the staff doing everything. I'd love to get all of us all hands on deck. So if you want to sign up for that, this is the week to sign up so we can start plugging you into different spots. Um, and that would be great. So just let us know and bring some people with you. It's going to be a blast. You know, you may serve for... Uh, uh, some of the time and then be able to hang out with your, your friends or people that are coming, uh, you know, we'll, we'll shift things around. The more people we have serving, the, the more we can kind of shift things around and, and have you involved. So just let us know that you're going to be there uh, to serve if you want to volunteer, uh, but you don't need to sign up to come. Just, just come. So 10 o'clock, right? 10 o'clock. We'll see you at 10 next week, 10 to 2. All right, we're going to continue in our series this week uh, on Proverbs. In fact, I've got two more weeks today. We'll do the feast next week, and then the first week of November, we'll, we'll finish up our Proverbs series, and then we're moving into another series called Faithful. It's really a powerful series. I'm already, I'm already uh, getting a lot of input from the Lord on what he wants to speak through uh, this series, Faithful, and so it's going to be a great series, so uh, get excited about that. And then we're into Christmas, which is just crazy to think about. So after the Faithful series, we'll be into our Christmas series, so that's just wild to think about for me. Is it wild for you? Somebody, anybody Christmas shopping right now? No? Okay. Well, you better quit. You better hurry because we're going to run out of stuff by November, right? So there we go. All right, here we go. So we are going to have some fun today, and uh, we're going to talk about a, uh, a topic that, uh, you know, we, I, don't, I don't think I've ever done a whole message on. I've talked about it in a message, or we've touched on certain things, but it's, it's an important aspect of God's heart, so I'm excited to talk about that today. Uh, if you're new with us, in Proverbs, we're reading the book of Proverbs, so there's 31 chapters. We have a 31-day challenge. Uh, you can read through the whole book of Proverbs by reading a proverb a day, 31 chapters, one a day, and so you can jump on board with us if you want, if you're new. Um, also, if you're new with us, on your seat rack in front of you is a communicator card. Just let us know that you're here. Uh, you know, we'd love to serve you. If there's any questions we can answer, anything we could do for you, just let us know on that communicator card. And there's blue tithe and offering boxes on your way out of every door. You can just drop those in there for you as well. Uh, members and attendees, uh, you can use those communicator cards as well. Put your prayer requests, praise reports on there, and make tithing and offering. Make that part of your worship. So it's a joy to bring back your first tenth of the Lord and, and whatever else he's telling you to give. So we, we just love to make worship part of our, it's part of our lives. It's not like we section that off. It's all part of worship. So uh, make that part of your worship today. Um, all right, today's about, you ready for a title? Correction. We got one yay? Come on, amen, people. Correction, right? Yes, correction. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, let me, let me correct you. We need a little more, a little more 
a little more from you, all right? So here we go. Actually, correction is a great thing. Uh, I want to share God's heart on correction first because I think we need that. For, for many of us that have been hurt by correction because it's been done unhealthily or, uh, you know, whatever the situation is, when we say correction, that's how you automatically view it through, is, through that filter of, oh, correction is bad. No, correction uh, from God's perspective is a beautiful thing. Hebrews 12, 6 says this, for the Lord disciplines those he, everyone say, loves. See, we look at God and we say, no, he's just mad at me. No, he loves you. He, he disciplines those he loves, and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. Let me read it out of the message translation. I like this. Uh, this will give you a different perspective. Same verse. My dear child, don't shrug off God's discipline, but don't be crushed by it either. It's the child he loves that he disciplines. The child he embraces, he also corrects. And so God's heart is, and let me, uh, we just sang about good, good father, and listen to some of the lyrics of that, of that song are straight out of scripture, right? So, God is perfect in all of his ways. He's never made a mistake. Jesus came and lived like us. We messed up the earth that God made. We sinned and we, we brought in all kinds of uh, temptation and things like that that, are, that God didn't want us to have. But God came and lived on the same earth that we lived in, lived 33 and a half years perfectly, never sinned, never made an error. And that's God. You've got to understand that that's who God is. God not only can't sin and can't make a, a, a wrong decision, but he also sees the whole picture at one time. A lot of times when we uh, are getting corrected by the Lord, uh, and I'm only going to use from the Lord's perspective, when God corrects you, remember that he sees the whole picture and he's never made a mistake. He's always perfect in his decision making and he wants what's best for you and for me. He desires what's best for you. So when he's correcting you, it's not just because he's annoyed with you. It's because he wants what's best for you. He truly wants what's best for you. But a lot of times, because we've been hurt through correction, it doesn't matter what the situation or circumstance is, that's how we view God as, well, God's correcting me because he's mad at me, or, or maybe you, you grew up in an environment where uh, the, the voices got elevated, right? Your correction, the, the louder that you correct, you know, the more correction you're receiving. Look, God, God isn't that, whatever your view is. So understand, his heart is, I correct those that I love. I correct my kids. And I love how he puts it in a family situation, right? We're all children of God. And he's the father, son, Holy Spirit, helper. He's here to help you. He's here to guide you. He's here to direct you. And it's for your benefit and my benefit. So now when you view correction, I just want you to see from a healthy perspective that God is here to correct you because he loves you and because he knows what's best for you. And he can see the whole picture and you can't. And so you want that kind of correction. Not only that, but I want to be corrected by somebody that's batting a thousand, don't you? Never got wrong. That's the correction I want to get from, right? We're going to get corrected in our human, in our jobs, and in our families, and those kind of things too. But looking at it from uh, your relationship with Jesus, God's never gotten it wrong. And when he's correcting you, it's because he loves you and he wants the best for you. And he sees what's down the road when you can't. And so I hope that encourages you, and I hope that kind of forms... Uh, at least the, the teaching today when we talk about correction, because if you've got a, a bad view of God when it comes to correction, you just need to close your eyes and throw that out for a second. Now you know God's heart. It's there to bless you. It's there to help you, not harm you. It's, he's for you. He's not against you. He's here to bring tremendous benefit when it comes to correction. All right, so let's look at Proverbs. Let's get, dig into Proverbs. I'm going to read two verses for you, and then we're going to close out the message because these verses are so good. All right, they're just so good. You only need these two, and then we could just pray and, and walk out if you want. All right, so here we go. Proverbs 1, 22 through 27. How long, you simpletons, will you insist on being simple-minded? How long will you mockers relish your mocking? How long will you fools hate knowledge? Come, here's God's invitation. Come and listen to my counsel. I'll share my heart with you and I'll make you wise. I called you so often, but you wouldn't come. I reached out to you, but you paid no attention. You ignored my advice. You rejected the correction I offered. So I will laugh when you're in trouble. I'll mock you when disaster overtakes you, when calamity overtakes you like a storm, when and disaster engulfs you like a cyclone, and anguish and distress overwhelms you. Now, I read that verse, and I need to remind you, especially if you're new with us, God's given you the perspective of two different perspectives somebody that loves God and wants to hear his correction and wants to hear his voice and somebody that does not. So because you're sitting here, I, I would pray and I hope, and we did pray for you this morning, that your heart is open to what God is saying. And if he's correcting, 
There's, there's good intention. There's good reason before it. And remember, God's, God's got every right to correct us because he knows all things. His way's above ours. His thoughts are above ours. And he sees the whole picture. So he has every right to speak to his children, us, the church. But God is not what, sometimes you read verses like this and you think, oh, well, God's just laughing at me and he's just mocking me. And while I'm down, he's, he's kicking me while I'm down. He's not speaking to you as a follower of God. He's speaking to those that don't want to hear from God at all. And let's be real, I've been there. Have you been there? I've been there. Before I knew the Lord, I didn't care what the Lord had to say. Didn't know what he had to say. And even if he did correct me, I wouldn't have listened anyway. And how many of you know there was tremendous damage and hurt and pain probably inflicted on you that God didn't desire for you and God didn't desire for me, but because we weren't open to his correction, we invited that. You know, there's another hearts and there's another mission uh, and somebody that's trying to snatch up, right? There's, there's a great parable that Jesus gave. The enemy's trying to snatch up this word very quickly. He's trying to take this away from you as quick as he can, right? He's trying to take away any good teaching. He's trying to take away a relationship or taking steps towards the Lord. He's, he's trying to take that away from you as quickly as he can. His job, his heart is to steal, to kill, to destroy. His job is to get you away from God. His job is to make you the mocker and the scoffer and one that would not hear from God. That's his job. And he doesn't love you. He hates you. He doesn't want what's best for you. He wants you to be hurt. And he wants you away from God. And that's who God's speaking to. Look, I'm, I'm not speaking to those people. I'm not speaking to the enemy or those that are influenced by the enemy so much that they won't even hear God, listen to God. Look, for them, there's, there's gonna be judgment. There's gonna be an appointment for them. But for you as believers, look, I understand we're not always gonna get it right. That's why we need a helper. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. That's why we need God. But because of your hurt and because of your pain and because of your view of God, look, God is not out to get you. He's not mad at you. He's not waiting for you to trip up so he can just laugh at you. That is not the case for you. In fact, if you'll tune your ears to him, if you'll listen, I love it. God's giving you an invitation. He's like, look, I wanna bring wisdom to you. I wanna help you. Even if you slip up as a believer, God's there to pick you up. He's there to help you get out of where you are. He wants the best for you. He desires the best for you. Look, he created you. He made you. He gave you the talents and gifts that are inside of you. And even what you don't have inside of you, maybe you feel like, oh, I'm not good enough. Listen, God can empower you with all that he has and all that he is. There's a supernatural side of God that is amazing when you have a relationship with him because he can give you what you don't have. He can give you the tools that you need. He can help you when you're weak. It really is a beautiful relationship we have with God. And correction is a beautiful thing. Look, the reality is, is if we, if we, because we have a relationship with a perfect God, that means that we've messed up. And we don't always have his heart in mind. Let's be honest, we're pretty selfish people. But as you keep walking towards God, you're going to desire his heart. You're going to see there's tremendous blessing. There's tremendous benefit in following God. And so here, let me read this next verse. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. My child, that's believers. This is followers of children. But Solomon's also writing to his own physical child as well. Don't reject the Lord's discipline. Don't be upset when he corrects you. For the Lord corrects those he loves just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. Solomon's trying to make the parallel of the closest we have to understanding God's heart and correction is if we're a family, if we're a parent, and we have children. That's the closest. We, now, I don't know about you. Any parents in here? Anybody blown discipline or correction as a parent? Right? You, you just blew it. You knew you blew it. Right? You had to go back to your kid and say, I'm sorry. That was just dumb. I shouldn't have done that. Right? I'm just sorry. Look, we're learning as parents, too. You're going to have to shift. You're going to have to evolve in your correction. But that's the closest we have to an analogy to God. Now, it falls way short because God's never messed up in correction. God's never messed up in discipline. But if I could give you any analogy, that's about as close as we can get to. You love your kids. You want what's best for your kids. You want them to do well. You want them to seek God. You want them to follow God. And, and sometimes we overparent. Anybody overparent? I'm an overparenter, Right? That's not good either. I overparent because I don't want them to make the same mistakes I do, but that's not helping them at all, is it? Because they're their own person. They've got to learn from their own mistakes. 
It doesn't mean that we don't discipline at all. We don't correct or we don't give guidelines. And then we have our underparenters. Anybody underparent? We don't like to discipline at all? Look, Proverbs is going to give you so much wisdom. And so if you're a parent, get excited. It's going to be so good for you, all right? Or look, if you're married, <laughs> if you're married, look, this is going to help you in marriage. If you're single, this will help you, all right? This will help you. If you're a kid in here, if you're a youth, this is going to help you. Look, this is so beneficial for all of us in any relationship we have. Proverbs 6, 23. And I'm going to need some help with this one, so get ready. Whoever, and I'm, it's going to need to be a, a, a male, and I'll tell you why in a second. It's not sexist in any way, so don't, don't clip that out or edit that on YouTube, guys. All right, here we go. Proverbs 6, 23. For their command is a lamp, and their instruction. Now, in the Bible, it changes the word for the word in many different ways. It says the word, it says commandment. It says precepts. There's a lot of different ways to talk about the scriptures, all right? So in this case, for their command is a lamp. The Bible, the word of God is a lamp. It's a lamp unto your feet. And their instruction, a light. Their corrective discipline is the way to life. Who's the way, the truth, and the life? Jesus is. His way is light. His way is life. And if he's correcting you, look, he's bringing life into you. He's bringing his way to you. That's always gonna be good. And so I need a guy to help me out. So who wants to come up? Anybody? Come on. Quick, we don't have all day. Give me a guy. One guy, one guy, one guy. Your mom's, come on, come on up here. Your mom's volunteering you. You've been voluntold. That's a new word for you. There we go. There we go. You've been voluntold. Come on up, Greg. Everyone give Greg a big hand. I promise you it won't be, it won't be too painful. All right, come on up here. All right, here we go. So if I was to tell you... Uh, and this is a simple way right now. It's like you can see, right? There's light. It's a good thing. If I was to tell you, how would you get down this stage if you, and walk out this room? Would go straight out the doors. Go straight out the doors. Yeah. Would you jump down? Would you go down the steps? Uh, I could do either or. You could do either or, and that would be fine, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So now, this is why I need a guy. This is my daughter's. <laughs> yes, she does sleep with this most nights. So, pink or silver? Silver, okay. I'm going pink. I'm just kidding. All right, here we go. Put that on there for me. All right. And we're going we're gonna to illustrate. Can you see anything at all? Nope. You sure? No cheating. I don't want you cheating, all right? So we're going to illustrate not only this scripture, like without it, clear as day, right? You knew where to go, lamp under your feet. You got it, right? So I want to I wanna illustrate another scripture, right? The rod of discipline. So I brought, I brought an amazing rod with me. I'm just kidding. I'm not going to spit that one. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was like, Mom's holding up her rod. She's ready for you. All right, here we go. <laughs> All right. So now if I was to uh, tell you, and so I'm going to, here, I'm going to move you over here so you're in the middle. All right. All right. And then I'm going to just turn you around a couple times just to make sure you're good. All right. Okay. Stay right there. All right. Yep. All right. Yep. This way a little bit. Okay. Good. All right. All right. Yep. All right. You can't see, right? I'm going to move my pulpit just so you don't run into it. So now, if you were to get off the stage right now, if I told you to get off the stage, how would you get there? I'm not sure. Okay, go ahead and try. Find your way. Come on, find it. It's about a seven of an inch drop, so just be careful. You sure? How are you doing there? You doing okay? I would, I, 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 I. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right, you can, you can pull off your mask. I'm just kidding. All right. Much harder, isn't it? You were doing pretty good, though. You almost made it, right? You almost made it. So isn't this what we do in life, though? I love how you, right? I wonder to God if that's what it looks like. When we don't ask for his help, we're making our own decisions, right? Now, with God, he's a lamp under our feet. We could see clearly. We could make good decisions, right? We wouldn't do anything foolish. But a lot of times what we do is we put on a mask or we, we don't look to God and we just try to figure life out. I, I wonder if our lives don't look like that sometimes. Like God's saying, don't do it, don't do it. But we're, we don't have any, any direction, any guidance, right? Thank you, Ben. Appreciate it. That's it. That's all I got. So, all right. A lamp under your feet. How foolish is it for us many times that we go through life without the Lord. And I say foolish because maybe you're here today and that's, that's where, just where you are. 
I just want you to know that God's given you his heart. Look, and many of us say, well, how do I hear God? Or how do I know I'm hearing God? Look, some, we can hear God audibly. I've never heard God's voice audibly, but it's in the Bible that he can speak audibly. So that's one way. And look, I, I'm with you. I'd love to hear that way. You can hear God. Sometimes you get an impression, right? This is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You have God inside of you. The Holy Spirit's living inside of you. And so he can impress upon you or he can say, ah, careful. How many of you, how many of you have been... Uh, made a decision, and for those of you that maybe this is relates to, how many of you guys have been going to make a decision and God said, whoa, red light, green light, or yellow light, right? Red light, no, stop. Green light, go ahead, you got my blessing. Yellow light, be cautious, right? Test it, test it first. So you can get impressions like that where God is just, you know, it's just a knowing. It's just something because you have a relationship with him, you have this knowing. Uh, but the best way to know God's heart is obviously through his scripture, Right? God says, my commandments, my word is a lamp under your feet, and it's going to give you good direction. So if you're making a decision, I don't care what the decision is. Young people, if you're making a decision in school, maybe you've got something going on with uh, a test or maybe college, uh, any of those things, you can ask God. God can help you. Now, you're not going to find a scripture in the Bible that says, okay, go to whatever the college may be. But you are going to find a verse in the Bible that says, I know the plans for you. I know the purpose I have for you. And so God can help you make Good decisions. He can know. Also, God made you, and he gave you the gifts and talents that are inside of you. So, you know, maybe your degree has to do with something like, maybe it's medical, maybe it's sports, maybe it's, uh, you know, mechanical or engineering. Whatever it is, it really doesn't matter. God made you that way. So he's going to help you make decisions based on his plans and his purposes for you. But we got to get to a place that we're okay with knowing his heart, reading the Bible, praying to God, talking to God, allowing him to speak to us, or... Even better yet, this is what I love about life groups. Get around a whole bunch of people that have God's heart that can help you, that can pray with you, that can give you direction. And we don't always know. And so, and be honest with people. I'm not really sure what God has for you, but I'll pray with you. I'll walk it out with you. This is a beautiful benefit. The, the Bible, God's heart, his word, it's a lamp unto your feet. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. You know, sometimes we get so anxious about our big decisions or our little decisions, whatever the decision is, we get so anxious. But have we forgotten what the Bible says to do when you're anxious? It says pray continuously. Pray always. Come to me in prayer. Now, I know some of you are like, yeah, that really works, John. I'm anxious. Just go pray, and it goes away. Listen, if you know his heart, he's going to help you. It starts with prayer, but maybe you need to keep asking, keep digging, keep looking at what his what is heart is for you. I had this fun conversation with my kids. I can't say what name it is because they started charging me $5 every time I mentioned their names, okay? <laughs> and so I had this fun conversation with my kids, and, and it, it went kind of, let's see, where am I going to go with this? I'll have to come back to it because I forgot what I was going to say. I'm getting older. My birthday's coming up. I'm 46, so I'm losing, <laughs> losing my memory. <laughs> That's embarrassing. What was the conversation? It was really good, too. I had a really good point. Slipped out. God, I need some help here. See? Correction. I need some help. I'll tell you when I remember. All right, here, let's keep going. All right, Proverbs chapter 9, 7 through 9. Let me give you some more wisdom on correction. Anyone who rebukes a mocker will get an insult in return. Anyone who corrects the wicked will get hurt. So don't bother correcting mockers. They will only hate you. Is that true? Yeah. Now, remember in the Bible, we learned this last week. If, if you're new with us, you can, you can watch all our messages back. So if you missed last week, you can catch up. The Bible says that a fool, that the Lord will change their name and call them a scoffer or a mocker. So you're going to see in Proverbs, after that verse, he begins to use mocker and scoffer instead of fool, but it's all the same thing. But watch this. But correct the wise, and they'll love you. Instruct the wise, and they'll be even wiser. Teach the righteous, and they'll learn even more. What a difference between being teachable and being offended. Right? Being a defender. There's a huge difference. God wants our hearts to be open obviously to his correction. But do you know that sometimes God's going to correct you through people? Yeah. And look, I'm not just saying let random people walk up and correct you. These are people that you know and you have a relationship with and have the heart of God and they, they want what's best for you because God wants what's best for you. And so correction can come in all shapes and sizes. God can correct you. You could be reading the scriptures 
And look, I, I'm right there in your shoes. I, I didn't always follow God. I remember reading the scriptures and I'm living one way and I'm reading the Bible and it's saying the total opposite the way I'm living. Look, that's correction. What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? And I realize for some of us, it's, that's, a, that's a tough shift. But this is what it is to be a follower of Christ. One area at a time, but take God's correction. Have an open heart. Be open to what he's saying. And remember, he loves you. That's why he's correcting you. Remember, he knows what's best for you. That's why he's telling you. Remember that he's out to bless you and prosper you, not to harm you like, like other situations you've been in. So when you read God's correction, it's for your best. It's not because he's trying to control you. I don't know where we get that mentality where God just wants to control you like a video gamer, attach some things like a puppet, and you just walk around. That's not the way it works. That's not love at all. You would not live in any aspect in that way. That's not love. God has given you his heart. He's given you his ways. He's given you the life, the abundant life that he died to give you so you can have it, so you can achieve it. By the way, it's achievable. It's not unreachable. You may be one decision away. Listen, you may be one decision away from seeing God's heart in a way that you've never seen it before. I love this next verse. Let me, let me read this for you. In fact, I may be a couple away, but I'll, I'll get there. Yeah. Guys, skip over to Proverbs 17.10. I'll go back in a little bit. But Proverbs, this is really deep. And maybe this is just kind of where you are. But let me read it first, and then we'll talk about it. Rebuke, another word for correction. Rebuke is more effective for a wise man. Now listen, more effective. So being corrected by the Lord is more effective from a wise man than a hundred blows of a fool. Now that's really simple, but it's very deep. How many of you have been living, walking through life, just getting blow after blow? Everything seems to be a, a punch in the gut. Everything seems to hurt. Everything seems to be coming and crowding in around you. Look, I don't care what the aspect, I don't know your life. A lot of times, and I did it too, I'd sit in the back and say, how did the preacher know what's going on in my life? Look, I don't know. But a lot of times it's relationships, it's our jobs, it's our marriages, it's our kids, it's our school. Maybe we're not doing real, we're failing in school, we got a bad grade. Blow after blow. After so many of them, you just feel crushed. You just feel like, God, why me? And maybe even talk to God in that moment and say, why are you, you blame God for it? You know what I've realized is that I'm a human being just like you. And the times where I'm getting blow after blow, a lot of, if I was to look back and honestly look at it, I was making bad decisions. I was making poor decisions. And even as a believer, we can make decisions without God we can make decisions without his counsel. Now, my heart and God's heart and this church's heart would be that we have such a relationship and we're maturing in our faith that we know God's heart and we make decisions, we know it based on what his heart is. I don't make decisions based on what everybody else is doing. Oh no, you're gonna get yourself in big trouble. I don't care what everybody else is doing. Kids, listen to me. Your friends are probably not gonna make the decisions that God wants you to make. You've gotta be okay with that because they don't know what's best for you, he does. Amen. He does. So be okay with reading God's scripture or seeing God's heart and making the choice to live that way. And from Jesus himself, by the way, that's where the abundant life is. The abundant life isn't being cool. The abundant life isn't doing what's popular. The abundant life isn't just doing what the world's doing. The abundant life is by following Christ. And it is abundant. Some people will say, well, following God's a joy sucker. No, my God is the God of joy. So he can't suck joy out when he is joy. Amen. It's no fun to follow Jesus. Really? Because Jesus said it's the most abundant life and he came to give me life. I don't want to counterfeit, do you? The enemy is counterfeiting the life that Jesus died to give you by covering it up as all these different sins and pleasures and things. I'm just telling you, a lot of people, your friends, your schoolmates, your classmates, your coworkers, other marriages, other people, look, they may say it's okay, but what does God's heart say? I'd rather, and I love this verse in, in verse 17, I love what it says. 
It says, I'd rather make one decision of obedience, basically another way to say it, rebuke or correction or receiving correction or turning or choosing to obey is the best way to say it. It's more effective for a wise man because you're wise because you're listening to God. One decision to follow God, one decision to obey is more effective than 100 blows. Would you rather take the 100 or the one? The one. Test God and see. Maybe you're in a place, listen, uh, I didn't always follow God either, even when I was following God and I was new in my faith. Even today, look, you're going to be uh, challenged with decisions to follow God every single day. But it's an honor and it's a blessing. I understand, look, God wants the best for me. Of course I want to obey him. But you may not get it all right. That's okay. You just say, I'm sorry, and you try again. But I realized before I knew God and while I was trying to understand God that, look, I, I faltered all the time. I lied. I deceived. I had a foul mouth. I was perverse. I stole things. I was immoral sexually. All of those things were true in my life. And maybe they're true in your life today. But I had to decide. You have to decide. We all have to decide. Look, I'm going to trust God in whatever area that is and see that God won't bless you and prosper you. Every time you trust him, every time you obey him. And look, it's gonna be, is the enemy gonna try to get you to go back? Absolutely. Is your flesh gonna want you to do it again? Absolutely. But you have to take your thoughts captive and submit them into obedience of Christ. That's what Philippians says. You have to submit it to obedience of Christ. That's what we have to do day in, day out. Every day you die to yourself which means you put down what you really want to do and you say, God, what is your heart? And if you don't know what it is, find it out. Start reading the Bible, start praying, start asking God, start getting around some people that love Jesus and let them help you. Get some counsel. All right, let me go back. Almost time, we got a long way to go. All right, let me go back. Where was it? Proverbs 10, 17. He who keeps instruction in the way of life, but he refuses correction goes astray. Is that true? He who refuses instruction. Anybody go astray after you follow Jesus? Ask yourself why. Ask yourself why. You still can today, but I don't think we want to. Why did you go astray? Because you stopped obeying his word. You start letting influence of maybe a friend or a relationship or a person, or you allowed the enemy to use somebody to influence you. You went astray because you went away from his word and his commandment. The lamp, now you put on a blinder and you're trying to Figure it out. Sometimes you're going you're gonna to fall. You're going to get hurt at times. But now you know. The Bible's so blunt, too. Don't you love it when God's just blunt? Some of you just need a blunt word. Proverbs 12, 1. Whoever loves instruction loves knowledge. Is that good? But he who hates correction is stupid. <laughs> stupid is as stupid does, right? <laughs> if you hate correction, just stupid. We'll move on. That's good enough. <laughs> Proverbs 13, a wise son heeds his father's instruction, but a scoffer, a fool, does not listen to rebuke, correction. Proverbs 13, 18, pro poverty and shame. Again, we learned this last week. Poverty and shame will come to those who disdain correction. Whenever you won't listen to the Lord, poverty and shame. Not because God's condemning you, because God doesn't condemn. Christ doesn't condemn. But the enemy will shame you. When we won't listen to the Lord, guess who's going to come in and shame you and say, oh, you're just such a terrible Christian. You're not saved anymore. Why do you even go to church? Anybody heard that before? Just get another spouse. It's your kid's fault. It's your mom's fault. It's your grandparents' fault. They've been dead 10 years. I don't care. It's their fault anyway. This is what the enemy does. Shame. Poverty, not financial poverty, although it could be financial poverty. Poverty because you're missing the abundant life Jesus came to give. You have lack. You have lack because you won't receive correction. You have lack because you won't see, receive abundant life. You have lack because you won't listen to the one who made you and created you and wants the best for you. So you have lack. You're frustrated. You're struggling. Look, it's okay to admit those things, but now you can come to God and say, God, how can I turn? Not just turn, but how can I make better decisions? What is your heart? What is my heart? And where am I missing it? Please help me. This is a great place to start this morning, if that's where you are. Proverbs 15, 5 says, Only a fool despises a parent's discipline. Kids, that's good. 
Whoever learns from the correction is wise. I believe we've got a lot of kids in here that want to be wise. Listen, look, your parents love you and they're trying to give the best for you. And we don't always get it right. Right, parents? I, I correct incorrectly sometimes and I have to shift and I have to do things differently. I have to apologize and I have to realize, okay, that didn't work. Do you know that every kid, how you correct every kid is different? Every parent's different. Every kid's different. The way you discipline each kid is different. It's a hard job, isn't it? And guess what? We have a father who has a lot of kids, and he does it perfectly every time. So even as a parent, you can get some help. The Bible's so good. Here, parents, you want some verses? You want me to give you some help? Here we go. All right, here we go, parents. Discipline for parents, not for you, but understanding discipline as a parent. Proverbs 19, 18. Discipline your children while there is hope. I love that. Which means while they're in your household, discipline your children while there's hope. Because otherwise, you'll ruin their lives. If you don't discipline your kids while they're at home, guess what's going to happen when they leave your home? They're going to go and be undisciplined. So discipline while there's hope. While you have influence, while you have that opportunity. Proverbs twenty two fifteen. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. Kids, listen, I am so sorry that I have to tell you this. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of the child. Now, I'm going to talk to the old people, kids. Now, just watch their hands, kids. Watch their hands. Ready? Hey, old people, I'm old too. How many of you know that when you were a child, you made foolish decisions? Come on, put up. Kids, look around. Look around. 100%, kids. 100%. We admit it. As kids, we made dumb decisions, didn't we? Dumb. Dumb. We watched a movie called Dumb and Dumber. Just dumb. <laughs> just dumb. Don't watch it. You'll just get dumber. It's just dumb. Right? As kids, listen, and I love kids because they make, they're so creative and fun and, you know, but sometimes you make foolish decisions. So when mom and dad comes up to you and says, hey, Joey, just use the name. If your name's Joey, I'm sorry. Joey, I wouldn't do that. They're just trying to tell you, I did that once, not going to go well for you. <laughs> I've been in that place. I climbed that tree and I hung off like a monkey and I fell. So, you know, I appreciate that you life climbing trees, but you might want to be a little more careful there, Joey. Right? Foolishness. Here we go. Here's another one. Here, here you go, parents. Ready? Don't fail to discipline your children. The rod of punishment won't kill them. The rod of punishment won't kill them. Physical discipline may well save them from death. So, look, every kid's different. Every parent's different. When it talks about physical discipline, look, that could be a variety of things. It's not that you're beating your kids. A lot of people read that and go, you want me to beat my kid? No, I want you to discipline your child. You've got to find a way that works for the child and for you as a parent. By the way, we have a great God that we can go to and ask because you and I were disobedient children at one time. You and I were lost at one time. You and I were unsaved at one time. And we had a God that by his grace came and saved us. So you've got to figure out a way to discipline. And sometimes you've got to take something away. You've got to give a consequence. Those are all good things, right? Another translation, the New King James says it this way. Use the rod of discipline so they don't go to hell. So we don't let them leave our homes without understanding discipline. And they go, they're going to be influenced by the enemy who wants to take them to hell. You have a God who disciplines. And he disciplines in a healthy way. Again, it's because he loves you. He knows what's best for you. He sees the whole picture. He thinks higher than you do. His ways are higher. His thoughts are higher. And then you have an enemy who's trying to destroy and steal and kill. You and I have an opportunity as parents to show God's heart by the way we discipline. By the way we discipline. And if you get it wrong, make it right with your child and try a different way. But don't give up. Don't give up. It's so important that we model this, parents. It's so important. That it's, it's hard. It's probably the stinkiest job as a parent, isn't it? It's hard. None of us like to discipline. Maybe there's some odd one out there that likes it. But remember, discipline is love. It's love. It's not fun. At least it's not fun for me. Maybe it's fun. For, it's not fun for me. In fact, I'm exhausted by the time it's all over. Exhausted. All right. Good enough, parents. You got some? 
Got some in your pocket. All right, here's a whole bunch more to chew on at home. If you want to learn more about discipline, we're already almost out of time. But here's a, here's a few more verses. So leave that up, guys. And I'm going to close with Proverbs 19. So if you've got your Bibles, you can get to Proverbs 19. Um, but write these down. Go ahead, jot them down if you want some homework. Right? If you want to learn more about correction, a lot more verses in Proverbs all through the Bible. You're going to see it's important. Did, did God correct Israel? Absolutely. Did God correct before Israel? Adam and Eve? Hello? Yes. Did Jesus correct? Yes. Will Jesus ultimately come back, and what will he do? Judge. Correct, right? He will ultimately do that. So it's a part of God that we need to understand, and he's got a beautiful heart, and we just need to understand it. Proverbs verse 19, I want to close with this. We're only going to focus on verses 20 and 21. But as I was praying, I really felt like I needed to end with this one because I think it's going to really hit home with a lot of us. Now, let me read this with you, Proverbs 20 and 21. I'm going to read this out of different translations. So, um, get all the advice and instruction you can, so you will be wise the rest of your life. So, get some good advice, get good people, good counsel, get in a life group, get all these things. Get people around you that are speaking God's heart with you. Share life together. Get good counsel around you. Verse 21, this is the one that really hit me, and I hope it hits you. You make many plans. You can make many plans, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. Do you make a lot of plans? Some of you have an 18-point pro, you know, as soon as you leave church, we're going here, we're going there, we're going there, we're going there, we're going to bed, going to school in the morning, going to work, boom, 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 right? Some of you got, you're like, you're that detailed, and that's a good thing. Look, God's given you a mind. He loves that you make goals. He loves it when you work hard. He loves it when you make plans, but he doesn't love it when you make plans and you make, and you take him out. And for a lot of us as believers, myself included, I've done this, right? We have all the plans in the world, and I believe your intentions aren't to cut God out, but you only have 24-7. You've got to give time to God, and Sunday's not enough. This is the most, this is the start of your week right here, Sunday. It's important we gather together. It's important we come and be encouraged. It's important we, we come and receive the word. Maybe today it's important that you get corrected, that you need to make sure God's a part of your life. If you don't schedule him in a slot and make it for the meeting, you're going to miss the meeting. If you don't make time to read the word of God, if you don't make time to pray, if you don't make time to gather with saints, if you don't make time to serve Jesus and his kingdom, you're not gonna have any time. God is a redeemer of time. The enemy is a stealer of time. What do you value? What do you value? Is God an important part of your life? Listen, I I am saying this with all conviction because that was my life, even as a pastor. I had a lot of great ideas. I remember as a youth pastor, some of the best ideas I've ever had. Some of the best. Did I ask God about them? Nope. These were good plans. And I love Jesus, so he's just going to bless them. Of course, I'd end in the name of Jesus after the dumb idea I'd do, right? And then the correction would come from the senior pastor. There's many holes in that wall that's been passed. I broke that window. I broke that window. I say I because I was the youth pastor and the kids broke the window, but guess who got responsible for it? Me. Dumb idea, John. I remember sometimes sitting down with the elders, had this big plan, big event. We wanted to give away a car. And it was a great idea. I I mean, it was really a good idea, but the elders said, nope, we're not going to do that. Now, they were wiser than me, but at the time, I was really mad. How dare you shoot down my idea? You know how many kids would come if I gave away a car? Come on. Right? These are things that we do. We make a lot of plans. But our job is not to make a lot of plans then end in Jesus' name at the end of it. Your plans don't dictate your plans and your purpose. The Lord dictates your plan and your purpose. And by the way, his plan will always prevail. I don't want you or me as a believer to go through 40, 50, 20, 10, however many years of life we have left. And then we stand before Jesus And guess what? He's going to separate like chaff, if you know what wheat is. He's going to separate what's not of him and what's of him. I don't want him to take, because we do have a lot of plans. We do have a lot of ideas. There's nothing wrong with that. But if 1,000 ideas were for you and one was for Jesus, guess how many is going to heaven? The one. And that's okay. God needs to separate what's not of him and what's him, what's holy and what's not holy. He needs to do that because no unholiness or no unrighteousness is going to heaven but I'd rather you hear it now. 
I'd rather you hear the word of God now. And maybe you need that correction. You're doing a lot of things. And look, I don't think you're intentionally trying to cut God out. But ask yourself the question, is God being honored? Am I asking him? Am I looking to him? Look, you can have a lot of ideas, but get his plans and his purposes first. Understand what he, his desire for you. Remember, he made you. He created you. He gave you that creativity. He gave you that talent. He gave you that gift. I don't want to go to Jesus, and I hope you don't want to go to Jesus, and stand before him and him separate three quarters of my life and burn it up and a quarter of it go to heaven. Now that may be right. God's always right. He's not going to make a mistake in that separating process. I want to go to Jesus and say, well done. Well done. And that doesn't mean we're going to be right 100% of the time. There's another great verse in Psalms that says, and it's basically the same thing. You know, if you were to build a house and you are to do all these things, you to make all these plans without God, that's void. That's void. It's not what God has for you. Jesus said it this way in the parable of the talents, and I'll close and then we'll pray. The parable of the talents isn't necessarily about money. There's an aspect of resources and there's an aspect of money, but the parable of the talents is about faithfulness and obedience. It's about you seeking God and it's about making plans and being creative, but understanding what the master desires, what his best for you is. The one had 10 talents, right? He had, the master gave him 10 talents and he sent him out and he said, hey, go. And he, he didn't tell him what to do. He gave him all creativity. He could use any idea he wanted. But at the end of the day, he was to be faithful and obedient with what God gave him. He was to be a good steward and he was to come back with even more than what the master had given him. And the one with 10 came back with 10 more. And God said, good job, high five. The one with five came back with five more. Good job, high five. He wasn't disappointed because he had five and he had 10. No, we all have a different measure. He said, good job to both of them. And then there was the one, you remember the one? The one, he said, well, I know you're a, uh, I know you're a man who corrects. So I took the, the talent and I dug a hole and I put it in the hole and I buried it. And the Lord said, look, that's not my heart for you. You could at least put it in a bank. Right? How many of you put $1,000 in a bank? Some of you be like, I'd love to have $1,000 in a bank. How many, if you put $1,000 in a bank, guess how much interest you're going to get? About a penny. Whew. Awesome. Woo! That'll pay for no gas at all, won't it? That is, but the Lord's, you could at least done that. At least give me a penny. Dig a hole and bury it. How foolish. And here's what God said. Look, I am going to take because the one wouldn't listen, he wouldn't take correction. I'm gonna take from you and I'm gonna give it to the person that I gave five to and came back with five or give it to the one that gave 10. And he didn't say, well, I'm gonna give it to one of 10 because he had more of the fives out. No, he's gonna give it to those that are faithful and obedient. God is looking to bless and use. And I know a lot of people look at this and go, ah, it's all about resources and money. No, let's think about relationships. I gave you two relationships and you literally buried the two in the ground. You didn't share your faith with them all. Now they have no relationship with Christ because you didn't share. I gave you five relationships and you, and they all came to Christ because you began to plant seeds. I gave you 10. Look, it's all the same. It's about you and I being faithful. We all have a different measure. So you don't always have to bring back tenfold or fivefold but be faithful, be obedient. Listen to the Lord. And if God corrects you and says, don't put it in a hole, don't put it in a hole. He'll take the penny, but he, he knows you can do more is what he's saying. Look, I know you can do better than that. And I created you to do more than that. Come on, my son, let's go. So I want you to stand to your feet. Maybe that's just where you are today. Maybe you're like the guy digging the hole. Maybe today you've been making plans and plans and plans. You love the Lord, you just, you don't spend time with Him. Outside of Sunday, there's six other days of the week. The next time you're gonna put yourself in the Word of God, the next time you're gonna hear the Word of God or sing the Word of God is next Sunday. That's not enough, it's not enough. We need it. Please hear me, I'm not discounting you online or you in the room, we need to come together. There's so much value and benefit coming together. 
but you also need a personal relationship with Jesus. I need a personal relationship with Jesus. And as your pastor, I can tell you, I've messed that up before too. So please hear me, if that's where you are, don't feel condemned by me because I've done it. I've made plans and plans and plans. And unfortunately, God wasn't in those plans. It's not that I didn't love him. I just, I lost focus. I got distracted. Let's pray this morning. Lord, I just thank you for this church. There's many phenomenal men and women right here in this room and online that are listening to your word today. Holy Spirit, is there anything? Is there anything we need corrected on? Lord, are there any of us that have just, we know that it's not the right decision, but we're continuing to make it. Holy Spirit, would you convict them right now? That's, that's what you do, you convict, and that conviction's good. It's not because you're mad at them or you hate them or you're, you're disappointed to them, it's because you want the best for them. And making that same decision over and over again is not the best for them, it's hurting them. It's creating pain or a hundred blows to the gut. But just one opportunity to obey, one step, one time trusting God is more effective than those hundred blows than that failed decision over and over and over again. So Lord, if there's anybody in this room, Lord, maybe it's committing their life to you. They know they need you as Lord and Savior, but they just haven't done it yet. Today's their day. Today's the day of salvation. Maybe they're in this room and they're a believer, but they're still. God, the old self keeps creeping back. They keep going back to those old decisions. You can go to God right now and just say, I'm sorry. It's starting today. Look, you can't change yesterday, but you can change now. You can change now. As you walk out this room, don't let the enemy snatch up the seed. Let that word fall on good soil. Begin to make a different choice. Turn. That's what repent means, that you, that you begin to think differently. Bring that thought, into dis, that thought into obedience. Don't disobey anymore. Bring that thought into obedience, whatever it is. I know it's different for all of us, but look, make a choice to trust God and obey God. See that he won't bless you and prosper you this morning. Lord, we love you. We thank you. Holy Spirit, speak to us mightily, powerfully, for your name and for your glory, for your kingdom. We love being your children. We love being your church. But we're gonna need help, and we need your help right now, right here in this place. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen.